with us. If you'll just take a moment to look at your bulletin of the announcements inside. I wanted to read that first one. I did have a good time uh, yesterday. There were a lot of people there, more than I thought would be there. But the Effinger Ruritan Club of the Palmer Community Center thanked all who volunteered uh, to make the 34th Annual Palmer Community Ice Cream Supper a success. So we give thanks for that. Um, and for the music I got to hear, that was good too. Um, don't forget we have adult and children's Sunday school starting September the 8th, so in about three weeks time. And again, if you'd like a book for the adults, just talk to me or Debbie. It's uh, Rediscovering Jonah. Don't forget to session meets tomorrow night. And I'd ask you to be in prayer for session as we meet tomorrow night. Um, we're going to be thinking about the future and what God is calling us to do here. So please keep them in prayer. And also, are there any joys and concerns to share, updates on people in our prayer list? Anything at all? Yes, we need to add Ray Hickman. He's in the UDM VA hospital in Salem with medical problems. Who, who was it again, Karen? Ray Hickman. It's Kimberly Hines' father. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. I'd like to welcome Ann's daughter Sarah and her husband Myron. It's and Samuel and Helen. Hi. <laughs> welcome. We're glad you're glad to be with us today. Anyone else? Joys and concerns? I have a joy. Um, I've not talked to you about it in kind of the congregation knows. Um, Adner, the young patient man that was my translator on medical missions, we became very close over the years, and I consider him like a son. And I keep everybody kind of updated. He and his family are stateside and have been now for, for a little bit. He didn't settle. But the first time I met him, he had been going over to university in the Dominican Republic, and he had two years of study done. And that was before the earthquake, the first time I was over there. And after the earthquake, situation was that he couldn't go back to school. Well, once he got stateside, he's worked very, very hard. And he graduated last week from Brown Young University. And I'm just so proud of him. And I wrote him this big letter. And he called me and he said, Mom, your letter made me cry. And I'm like, oh, goodness, now I'm crying. <laughs> So I consider him my oldest child. But just, he's so blessed. I'm so blessed. Congregation's been very supportive. Thank you. I'm going to say something, and I haven't passed this through the bus, but our granddaughter is leaving tomorrow to go to Chicago for training, and she is heading off to Cambodia for a and this is part of the Lutheran Church. It's young adults in the global mission. And she can't leave the country for a year, so of course we are all kind of nervous. But um, please keep her in your prayers, and it's going to be a year. It's going to be a long year. We'll keep her in prayer. Anyone else? Joys and concerns? If not, will you please uh, turn to your bulletin now to the call to worship. And please join with me from Psalm 111. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in company with the congregation. The works of your hands are faithful and just. All your precepts are trustworthy. The fear of the Lord is the standing of wisdom. All those who practice it have been judged. Let us pray. Holy and Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that all people may know the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. Please stand now and turn to our first hymn, number 442.
hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And may the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us all in eternal life. Amen. Be most careful then how you conduct yourselves, like sensible people, not like simpletons. Use the present opportunity to the full, for these are evil days. So do not be fools, but try to understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not give way to drunkenness and the dissipation that goes with it, but let the Holy Spirit fill you. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, give thanks every day for everything to our God and Father. The second scripture reading is 1 Kings chapter 2. And I'm going to read 10 through 12. And then I'm going to skip over to 3 and read 3 through 5. So David rested with his forefathers and was buried in the city of David, having reigned over Israel for 40 years, 7 in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. And Solomon succeeded his father David as king and was firmly established on the throne. Solomon himself loved the Lord, conforming to the precepts laid down by his father David. But he too slaughtered and burnt sacrifices at the hill shrines. Now King Solomon went to Gibeon to offer a sacrifice, for that was the chief hill shrine, and he used to offer a thousand whole offerings on its altar. There that night the Lord God appeared to him in a dream, and said, What shall I give you? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You all have to bear with me. This one changed a lot this morning. So we'll see there's stuff written all over my types and stuff. Uh, when I was a boy growing up in Tacoa, Georgia, uh, my sister and I used to stay at a daycare center called Happy Corner. Uh, I wasn't very happy there, but, but, but that's the name of it. But we'd stay there after school sometimes, and a big part of a couple of summers we had to as well. But that's where I learned how to swim. Um, I remember being afraid, and you know, I was afraid of the water. Um, but the young man who taught me, who I thought was really old, right? You know, when you're a kid. Oh, is he? he must have just been 20. But the young man who taught me was really patient 
and encourage me as he taught me. So I learned, got more confident. I sort of eased my way out farther and farther into the deep end. Um, but to graduate from that class and get your official patch, you had a patch, you had to dive into the deep end and hold your breath all the way from one end of the pool to the other. And so I was a little concerned about that. And I remember praying that the Lord please help me. You know, I, that, that was the prayer, make it to the other side. If I can't make it, at least don't let me drop like a rock, you know, into that abyss of that deep end and drown. You know, that was my heartfelt prayer. Please, Lord, don't let me drown in this deep end. So um, that kind of heartfelt crying, that kind of prayer, uh, I bet you've made those prayers yourself. Oh Lord, give me what I need to overcome what I'm facing. But if you can't do that, if it be your will, give me what I need to endure it. To come out on the other side, right? Still singing your praises. Able to stand. Craig Barnes, the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, um, has written this about the Christian life in his book, Hustling God. And this is a quote. Your calling is not primarily to accomplish something, but to serve God who will always lead you to places where you are in way over your head. So hear that again, especially session. Um, your calling is not primarily to accomplish something, but to serve God who will always lead you to places where you are in way over your head. And so Barnes is reminding us that God has a habit of tossing his people into the deep end. <laughs> and that's where our reading for the day finds Solomon in way over his head. You know, his father is dead and he's now the head of the family. He's grieving. He's afraid. He's carrying a heavy load. And so he's no longer swimming in the safety of the shallow end of his childhood because with one swift toss, Solomon is headed into the deep end of adulthood. And you know what a deep end it really is. It isn't just the loss of his father that Solomon is forced to confront. It's who his father was. Think about that. You know, his father's David. His father's David, the great king of Israel, the slayer of Goliath. The liberator from the Philistines, the unifier of all the tribes, the master musician and wordsmith, the man after God's own heart. Huh. Wow, something to live up to, right? <laughs> A lot to have to live up to. So with David's death, Solomon not only took his place at the head of his own family, but he's now the head of the whole kingdom as well. And all those expectations, ready and not. And it's clear that Solomon is not ready. Is not ready. Now the author of our story here in 1 Kings is kind to Solomon. When he writes, Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of his father David. Only. It's kind of a tag on the end. Only. He sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. Oops. That's some kind of caveat, isn't it? You weren't supposed to do that. When you went to those high places, the hill shrines were really to Baal and Asherah and Ashtar. You weren't supposed to go up there. The Lord didn't want you to do that. This is a recurring thing all throughout. And so he wasn't supposed to do that. So he kind of taxed it in. And he walked in the Lord, but he went up there and offered incense at the high places. So, you know, the second half of that sentence brings into question the first. Solomon loved the Lord, but... Well, he didn't fully. He, wa he wasn't walking totally in the statutes of his father David. And we know this because shortly before his death, David calls Solomon to his bedside and tells him it won't be long until he becomes king. And David then gives his son some final words of advice, and I'm not reading that this morning. But that final piece of advice is not making sacrifices and burning incense at the high places. That's decidedly not on that list because that's going to break covenant with God. That's going to break covenant with God. And so again, I think the author is trying to tell us as gently as possible, 
that while Solomon tried to follow in his father's footsteps, it's clear that he's not his father. It's clear that he's definitely not his father. He is, in fact, a mess, right? Um, he's in way over his head. But the good thing, what I want you to see, the saving grace, if you will, was that Solomon knew it. He knew it. And when confronted with it, he fesses up to it. And an even better thing, full of God's grace and love and forgiveness, is that even when Solomon has forgotten or just abandoned the covenant of you know, God's way, God in his infinite mercy finds the way to him. God finds Solomon in Gideon. Right? That's what it said. Where, where he's gone once again to make some more sacrifices and to burn some more incense, even though he knew that. God followed him. So isn't that our wonderful God? Isn't that truly God? The one we worship, the one we study in the Bible, the one who was revealed as the hound of heaven, right? Who loves us so fiercely, he relentlessly pursues us all over. Even in those deep places where we fall, so that he might bring us back to himself again. That is our Lord. I mean, you wouldn't go up to the hillsides again to sacrifice to the Lord, but to pour out your heart to Baal, Asherah, Astar. And yet God does follow Solomon and find him there. When I was thinking about it this week, you know, there could be another reason why Solomon would be so devoted to worshiping in the high places. A reason that has nothing to do with his faith or the lack of it. That's far away from Jerusalem, right? By doing so, Solomon buys himself some time. He doesn't have to be there in the throne. He doesn't have to be there and act like the king. It's going to take a while to offer a thousand burnt sacrifices. Just think about that. All that goes into that. Days, you know, probably. Day after day. Uh, at the very least, it was time consuming enough that it required him to camp out for a night, right? He went to sleep. And as long as Solomon is worshiping there, he doesn't have to get about that difficult task that the Lord has given him of being the king, of following in his father's footsteps. He doesn't have to make the leap into the great unknown by faith and trust in the Lord. He can stay in the safe, shallow end of his life. You know, it's the perfect disguise, really. You know, what, what do the people see? His people. They see what he's doing as an act of deep devotion, right? Look at our king. When in reality, he's doing it all out of fear. You know, it looks, it looks to all the kingdom that Solomon is constantly running to God and being with God for help. When it's really the opposite, he's running away. But again, lucky for him, even Solomon can't run in his sleep. And that's where the Lord finds him. And so the Lord appears to Solomon in this dream and asks him what he wants. What he wants. And Solomon opens up his heart to the Lord. You know, the lectionary text uh, goes on, and I'm going to read that now. In verse 6, start. This is what Solomon says to the Lord. You, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. If we really know the history of the Bible, that ain't quite right, but that's how you see it. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, which is true, God loved that, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I'm only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. You know, can't, can't you hear it coming out of his mouth? Solomon's basically saying, I'm not up to this God. I'm a little baby. I'm a little child. You put me in this place of my father, but I'm not my father. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm scared to death. So then Solomon tells God what he wants. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people. Able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It's a prayer from the heart. A cry for help 
Oh, Lord, give me what I need to overcome what I'm facing. But if you won't do that, give me what I need to endure it. And the good news is that the Lord gives Solomon both. Verse 11, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. And you know, the rest is, as I say, history, right? It came to pass, just as the Lord had said, and King Solomon is still known today for his wisdom, right? For his understanding mind, which is, I think, something of a shame, really. For unless you know how Solomon acquired that wisdom, you might think he was born with it. It's a natural talent. No, it's not. We know differently. It was a gift of God, pure and simple. The only thing Solomon knew was that he didn't know anything about being king. And come to find out that was the only thing he needed to know. Because he cries out to the Lord. He turns to the Lord. And so if Barnes is right and God is constantly leading us into places where we are in way over our heads. Then this story about Solomon is such an important one for our journey of faith. For our journey of faith in this life. It means we can surrender into the arms of God. Trust God. And stop pretending that we have everything under control. It means we can stop wasting time and energy on our own high places. You know? What are your high places? <laughs> our own personal givings. Pretending to be something or someone we're not. It means we might as well stop running away from God because God is going to go find us anyway. Come after us. It means that when we realize all that we cannot do, we're in a per perfect position to discover all that God can. Amen? What God can do. It means that we can't avoid the challenge set before us if we're headed into the deep end sooner or later, one way or another, we should ask God for what we need. We should boldly pray for the talents, for the gifts, for the Holy Spirit to fall upon us, for wisdom, for patience, for whatever we know God knows that we need to be about His work and call. We should trust, confident that God will always come through. He's promised to be with us wherever we're gathered. God is with us by the power of His Holy Spirit, even this moment right here with us. But we can't dictate to God how that answer comes. He'll give it. But the good news is that God always comes with the answer. And that is Solomon discovered that night and giving is the very best news of all. God. God's self. That's the greatest gift. His presence with us. Now this morning I was sitting as I always do praying and thinking about you know, this sermon. And the Lord laid it in my mind a poem. Because, you know, again at Happy Corner learning to swim you know, one of the first things they taught us was how to float. You know, let, let the water in itself buoy us up. You know, that, that relaxing back, that trusting to the water. You know, that was hard. I remember, that, what? How can I? How can I? I remember it was hard at first, but it's the perfect thing to do if you're tired, if you're scared. If you're hurt, let the water, let it do all the work. The heavy lifting. All you have to do is trust and surrender yourself. And that's what God says to we, his people. That's what God says to us. And so I, I wanted to read this poem 
is by Philip Booth. And of course, he's using a metaphor of the sea, but I want you to think of God there. So it is. Um, Philip Booth, a um, student of Robert Cross at Darwin. So up in New England. This is first lesson. Lie back, daughter. Let your head be tipped back in the cup of my hand. Gently, and I'll hold you. Spread your arms wide. Lie out on the stream and look high at the gulls. A dead man's float is face down. You will dive and swim soon enough where this tide water ebbs to the sea. Daughter, believe me when you tire on the long thrash to your island, lie up and survive. As you float now where I held you and let go. Remember when fear cramps your heart what I told you. Lie gently and wide to the light of your stars. Lie back and the sea will hold you. Let us pray. Lord God, how often we find ourselves in over our heads. When we find ourselves looking down into that dark, deep abyss, not really knowing what's down there, Lord, give us the faith to jump, trusting that you'll be there with us, granting us the gifts we need to overcome what we're facing or the courage simply to endure for your name's sake. Either way, we trust that you'll be with us. And that will be more than enough. Amen. If you'll please stand now and join with me in our affirmation of faith, which is from the Westminster Confession of Faith. By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all believers being vitally united to Christ, who is the head, are thus united one to another in the church, which is his body. He calls and anoints ministers for their holy office, qualifies all other officers in the church for their special work, and imparts various gifts and graces to its members. He gives efficacy to the word and to the ordinances of the gospel. By him, the church will be preserved, increased, purified, and at last made perfectly holy in the presence of God. Please be seated and turn to our next hymn, number 326.
two of silence, and then we'll pop for it. Lord God, we come before you again as your people. We give thanks for your goodness to us. We give thanks for your love. We love you. Help us to love you. Lord, we know that you hold us up that you come after us, that you want us to be in full communion with you. It's such an awesome thing to think about, to experience, Lord. Just open our hearts wide to that. Help us to surrender into your arms and trust you. Lord, I pray for each person here. I pray for each member of this congregation. I pray for this session that your Holy Spirit would fall on us. Lord, we can't do anything without you. You're the reason we're here. So guide us, Lord. Fill us. Help us have that zeal and that burning desire to do what you ask us to do. Lord, we're mindful of all your goodness, not only by your love shown through Jesus, but also in your word. We give thanks for your word that shows us who we really are. And shows us who you really are. And so we rejoice in that. Help us to be filled with the spirit, the desire to know you more, to, to read your word more. And Lord, we give thanks for the privilege of being able to pray for one another. To stand in the gap for one another. To lift each other up for whatever we're struggling with. Help us to reach out to each other. To grow closer to each other as well as you. And Lord God, we give thanks for all the gifts that you do give to your church. All those myriad of gifts, different ones. None of us have all of them. We need one another. But I trust that you brought us all here together for that purpose, for that reason. To lift your name, to be your witness in this community. Lord, you know that many of us here and not here this morning are struggling with things physical. 
Lord, we ask you to put your hand upon those that need your healing touch. Let them feel close to you. Let them feel your peace. And Lord, I don't only pray for this church, this congregation, this community, but for our whole country, Lord. Help us to remember you as we near this election. Help us to put you first. What you call us to do and to be. Help us to show your love. No matter our politics. You are our King, Lord Jesus. Lord, I give you thanks once again for the beauty of this place that you surround us with. The beauty of you as creator, as sustainer. Lord, we know that all things come from you. Everything that we have is a gift from you. Help us to respond out of love. Lord God, sometimes the hardest thing to do is just sit still and let you win the battle. But help us to do that. Help us to wait on your will. For if you don't build the house, it won't be built. And so, Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name to fill us with your spirit. Help us to know your will. Pour it out on your section here, on all of us. And help us to relax back into your arms. Those arms that were spread wide on the cross. To set us free. Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to hear your voice. We love you. We pray it in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but the For Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, freely you have received, freely give.
Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Our final hymn today is number 282. Thank you. 